Hello, welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about both series and sequences. So let's get started. When we first talk about sequences, just realize that we're talking about essentially a list of numbers that are arranged in some order. And it could be we're adding or subtracting. It could be a sequence where each step builds on each other. For example, um, perhaps I start the number one and I want the next number to be one after that. But then from that point on, I just add the two most recent numbers in the sequence. So right now, the two most recent numbers are one and one. If I add those, I get two. And if I add the two most recent numbers now, one and two, I get three. And if I add two and three, the most recent numbers in the sequence, I get five. And then three plus five is eight. 5 plus 8 is 13, 8 plus 13 is 21, and so on and so forth. This is a sequence. It's an arrangement of numbers in a particular order. And that order might seem random, or you might recognize it. In this case, this is the Fibonacci sequence. Um, this sequence right here is rather famous for a lot of reasons. But this sequence also is recursive. So we can define it um, by saying, what's our first step? Our first step is 1. Our second step is also one. And then every step after that adds the two steps before it. So if I want, for example, to find the third step, I add one step before it and two steps before it together. And one plus one is two. If I want the fourth step, I have to add the third step and the second step, and so on and so forth. So if I want the nth step, any particular step, I have to add the n minus 1 step plus the n minus 2 step, and that's written here. If I want any particular step, I have to add 1 before it, minus 1, and 2 before it. And this is a sequence. Now, this is a recursive sequence. And what that essentially means, in general, when you have a recursive sequence, you're building it one step at a time. So you know the first step, you know the second step, then you can find the third step and the fourth step and the fifth step by using the previous steps. You can't jump around. If you want to jump to the hundredth step of the Fibonacci sequence, you have to find the, the 99 steps before it, right? You have to go at, go at it one step at a time. And in general, recursive steps are defined by one or more previous steps. And you'll find that some sequences are strictly recursive. You can't jump around. And some, some sequences you can write with a recursive formula or you can find an explicit way to write it. In other words, you can jump ahead and maybe find the hundredth step of it by plugging in a value or an input. So we have all types of sequences. So when we look at explicit sequences, like I said, um, you can jump around. You don't need it to go step by step. And you usually have some input. We usually use n or k or something to find a particular step. And a nice challenge is to think, how do we do that? For any particular sequence, how do we do that? So here's a sequence right here. And I like this one because, yes, it's a series of fractions, and yes, it's fun to find, but I also like to think of it as just a fun arrangement of our counting numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. We have the counting numbers here just written as a fraction. Now, this is an explicit sequence. You could write it recursively. You could say, well, if I knew this step, what do I have to do to find the next step? Well, I add 2 up top each time. And then I add 2 on the bottom each time. And also you can say, take any particular step, look at the one before it, and add 2 to the numerator and 2 to the denominator, and you have the next fraction. That would be thinking of it recursively. Explicitly would be saying here, if I want to find some future step, what number can I plug in to an equation to find that step? So let's, let's try that. Why don't you pause the video and try to find the 100th step and write a rule for any particular step that you might want to find. Okay, so you tried it out, you can pause the video. If not, do that now. Let's let's discuss this together. So here, well, that's for a future video. Did I not write it down? <laughs> um, maybe I have it in my PowerPoint slide. Let me see what I have here. Oh, okay. So here I have um, a place for us to write the hundredth step and the nth step. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just kind of show some of the thinking I hear from students. So here we have one fix my pen, that's not right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on, right? What I hear from students who often have success with this problem is that they look at the numerator as a series of odd numbers. We're adding two each time. 
and they look at the denominator as a series of even numbers. In other words, they often view the numerator and denominator as kind of like separate entities, completely separate of each other. And if we look at this series of odd numbers, right, odd, and then we look at the series of even numbers, I'm saying series, the sequence of even numbers, excuse me. Um, we'll talk about series when you add a sequence, so these are sequences of numbers here. An odd sequence of numbers can be represented by 2 times n plus or minus 1 here. And if we say this has to be our first step, we call it a1. This is our second step, a2. This is our third step, and so on and so forth. Um, when we're testing it out to figure out which one works, plug in 1 for the first step. 2 times 1 is 2, but we need to get 1 in the numerator for an odd. So we don't want to add 1, we want to subtract 1. And then on the even numbers here, our input, our n value is 1, and then 2 is these little subscripts right here. Those are the n values. Our input is 1, so we want to get a 2, so we multiply it by 2, and that will give us the even numbers. And in general, this is giving us the nth step. Right? We're trying to find, in general, what's happening. 2 times n minus 1 over 2 times n. This is the formula for the nth step. So I found that first. Um, and then we look at the 100th step. Plug that in, 2 times 100 minus 1 over 2 times 100 equals 199 over 200. And that fits the bill, right? Each, each time the numerator is 1 less than the denominator, which is a thing to observe as well. But we want to make sure we're generating the odd numbers up top and then the even numbers in the bottom. Let's go back to our presentation here. So we have this for our hundredth step and this for the nth step. And there are other ways to think about it, but that's essentially the idea. So this is an explicit sequence. I could plug in n. If I want to find the thousandth step, I can plug in 1,000. I'll be able to find it. Whereas a recursive step, finding the 1,000th thousandth, thousandth step could be very problematic if you're not automating it through a computer. To do it by hand, you have to go through 999 steps in order to find the 1,000th step on a recursive sequence. So that's a problem. But there are sequences that need to be recursive. There are sequences that we can't write explicit formulas for. So we have these things, and they exist. Now, a sequence is uh, numbers that are appearing in a particular order. They, they show up. A series is when you add those numbers, right? And that's what a series is. So that's what we'll talk about next. In a series, when we sum up the numbers, how do we deal with that, and, and what does it look like? So when we sum the numbers, or that means add, how many do we add? Well, it depends on the problem. And we also, we don't often add all the numbers in a sequence, we add part of them. So we have what are called partial sums, which are also expressed, and this goes a little bit beyond partial sums, through summation. So when we talk about series and adding up the, the terms of a sequence, the question is what part do we add? That's a partial sum. And summation gives us a little bit more of an advanced way to write that down in notation. But it's the same idea, you want to add a part of the sum. And this is a certain kind of notation using sigma that ends up being really helpful. So let's look at a partial sum problem. I really enjoy these. So partial sum, we're using this notation, the partial sum up to the nth step. So s subscript n. You add up the different terms in the sequence up to the nth step. So if I wanted the third partial sum, I would have the first three terms of the sequence, one, two, three. If I wanted the tenth partial sum, I had to add up, up to all of the terms up to the tenth term of the sequence. And often the game is, um, or the, the I call it a game, but often the fun way to think about this is not, okay, just adding them up, but what patterns can we find that make the adding easier? What cancels out? What happens? So let's try one together. So why don't you pause the video? Here's a formula that tells you how to find the nth step of a particular sequence. If we did this for the first 50 terms of the sequence, what would we expect to find? What would that partial sum be? So go ahead, pause the video, try this out, start writing out some terms, see what you can find, and then start looking at the partial sums. Okay, so you tried it out on your own, now let's, let's try it together. Let me go over here. All right, so this is telling me, you know, this is saying that the first step, for example, is equal to 1 over n, 1, minus 1 over 1 plus 1. So that's 1 minus 1 half. And that, incidentally, that is also the first partial sum. The first partial sum is very unexciting. It's just the first term. What about the second partial sum? Well, it's going to be what we have over here, 1 minus 1 half plus the second term. 
So I'm going to just find the second term. The second term is plug in 2. It's 1 over 2 minus 1 over 2 plus 1, 3. And here we start to notice, okay, instead of going from left to right, I've got negative 1 half and positive 1 half, and we're adding those, those will cancel. And what I'm left with is starting with a 1, just like I did before. And before I end it with a half, now I'm going to just have the minus 1 third at the back there. Let me just clear that highlighting off. That'll be confusing. So this will be 1, this first term, minus 1 third. And then we go to a third partial sum. It's going to be the second partial sum that has the, the sum of the first two terms. So I'm going to rewrite that. Plus the fourth term, plug in a 4, 1 over 4. Minus 1 over 4 plus 1, 1 over 5. And, um, oh, I plugged it off, sorry. This is the th this is the first two terms. Now with the third term, I plugged in the fourth term. 1 over 3 minus 1 over 3 plus 1, 4. And here you can see that same canceling. And in fact, we're always going to have middle terms here that are canceling. And what we're left with is the 1 minus the fourth. And now we actually are in a position to find the 50th partial sum. This is where that pattern hunting comes into play. So in general, what's happening? Well, in general, we're starting with 1 no matter what. Then we're subtracting. And what are we subtracting? It's a fraction where the numerator is always 1. And the denominator, let's look at that in relation to the partial sum. 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 4. So these denominators are always 1 greater than the value of the partial sum. So I'm looking for the first partial sum. It ends over 2. Second partial sum ends over 3. So it's always going to be n plus 1. And that just means the 50th partial sum will be 1 minus 51. And in that way, you know, we use this pattern here to, to find this formula that helps us um, conclude with the 50th partial sum. Otherwise, oh my gosh, otherwise you have to go through all of this together. It would be really intolerable, right? So many of these partial sum problems, your goal is look for a formula, an explicit formula that helps you to deduce what a future partial sum might be. Let's try one more together, partial sum. So this time, um, looking for a partial sum, we'll do the first 50 terms. But instead of giving you a formula, I'm going to give you the sequence. So here's the sequence. It's a famous one. And we want to that's the sequence itself. We want to find the series. Let's find the partial sum of the first 50 terms. So why don't you pause the video and then press play when you're ready to solve it with me. OK, so let's solve this together. Um, here we are. So here, by the way, this is a really, it's a famous one. Of I think I enjoy it. Uh, you might have seen this before. Think of the, think of area for a moment to solve this problem, even before you figure out what's going on. We have the full area. Let's say this is a one by one, and first we take a half, and then we add a fourth to it, which is half of a half. Then we add an eighth, which is half of a fourth, and then we add a sixteenth, which is half of an eighth. And then we add a 32nd, which is half of a 16th, and so on and so forth, right? Eventually, we're filling up this square with an area of 1. So if, we, if we're looking at this partial sum as we approach infinity, as we keep going, we know we're going to get closer and closer to 1, but never exceed it. And that's a really fun application. So we'll talk more about partial um, We'll talk about sums towards infinity. Um, but there's a nice picture about what's happening here. And it adds to some of the depth behind this problem. But we want to know the partial sum of the first 50 terms, and in general, the nth partial sum, um, where n is not infinity, but it can be a very large value. So the first partial sum is just the first term. That's a half. The second partial sum is the first two terms added together. And that's a half plus a fourth is 2 fourths plus 1 fourth is 3 fourths. 3 fourths. Oh. <laughs> Boy, I fixed that. Three fourths. The third partial sum. Now I'm just going to take my second partial sum and add the next term. So it's three fourths plus one eighth. So that's six eighths plus one eighth or seven eighths, and so on and so forth. By so on and so forth, I mean we have enough here now to figure out our pattern. The nth partial sum. You can see what's happening here um, that the numerator is always one less than the, the denominator each time. One less, than two, 1 less than 2, 3 is 1 less than 4, so on and so forth. So we should expect the numerator is 1 less than the denominator, and that's important. And we should also suspect that if we look at, again, the numerators and denominators separately, you might notice the, the denominators are powers of 2. 
the first power of 2, the second power of 2, and the third power of 2. So in general, we have 2 to the n on the bottom. For example, here I've got n is 3, and 2 to the third is 8, n is 2, 2 to the second is 4, n is 1, 2 to the first is 2. And then up top, on the numerator, we have 1 less than that power, so 2 to the n minus 1. So if I was looking for the 50th partial sum, it would be 2 to the 50th, and then up top, 2 to the 49th minus 1. And there we go. So these partial sums, again, you're looking for patterns to deal with these complex problems, and you get a glimpse over here as to kind of the visual models we can look at if we were to just keep adding this sum forever and ever, right? As we get closer and closer to infinity, as you approach infinity, this begins to approach the number 1, right? And you can see right here, these are very, very close to each other. Um, and you're approaching that value. So the difference between, right, the, this, there's only a half between one and, uh, between this fraction here and one, then there's only a fourth and only an eighth. The distance between, the, the difference between the outputs of the partial sums and one is getting less and less and less. So right here, the difference between this fraction and one is decreasing. So we have all kinds of fun problems with partial sums. Partial sums, you, you might notice here, they keep starting at the first term, okay? They start at the first term, just go on. But what if we don't want to do that? What if we want to add, like, maybe the third through 50th term, right? How do we deal with that? So we kind of take our partial sum notation a little bit further, and we look at what are called summations. And summation uses uh, the, the simple sigma, this cool-looking E right here. And summations look kind of like this. And what we have on the bottom is what is called our index, our starting point. n tells us how far in the sequence to go. So right now I'm starting at the first term, I'm going up to the nth term, but I could really start at any term in the sequence. I can start at the fifth term, the tenth term, whatever I want, and then I can go up to whatever value I want. And then over here is the explicit formula that describes that sequence. So this implies that we're adding, it starts at an index value, it goes up to a value, and this tells me uh, what the explicit formula will be. So there are all types of problems we can do with this. And there are interesting properties as well, but I just wanted you to see that notation. And um, what we'll do in a moment is we'll apply that to an arithmetic sequence um, where we're adding a constant value. But let me go back here and show you a few things with summation. Okay, so like I said, um, down here, this is the index value. It's where you start in the sequence. This is where you end. Start, or this is the index. And this is the explicit formula that describes for the kth term. Or usually, sometimes we say nth, but here's the kth term of the sequence. So what does this mean? Well, if you saw something like this, let's say that you saw this. Let's say k equals 1 to 4 of 2k. This tells you I'm adding. That's the sigma, the summation notation, and the sigma right here tells you to do. I'm adding every term of the sequence from the first term of the sequence to the fourth term of this sequence right here, defined by this formula, explicit formula right here. So I start by plugging k equals 1, 2 times 1, and then I keep going. 2 times 2, all the way up to 4. 2 times 3, plus 2 times 4. And there are lots of fun properties with this. For example, um, when we look at our index value of 1 here and we go up to 4, you can play around those values and then mess around with your explicit formula to get the same sum. So for example, if you said, okay, I want the same sum, but I want to start at 2 and end at 5. Now that's still a difference of 3 between the start and the end. It's four terms in total. And I want to get the same sum. So to do that, I just define my explicit formula a different way, I subtract 1. And the reason that works is if I plug in 2 for k, I get 2 times 2 minus 1. 2 minus 1 is 1, and I have the same term before. If I plug in 3 for k, I get 2 minus 3, two, 3 minus 1 times 2, which is 2 times 2, and then so on and so forth. So what the point, um, I just want to reveal this a little bit, it's not about this particular sequence that's so particularly important or anything, but the idea that you can play with your index, your start and end values, and then your, your explicit formula to get the same sum is really helpful in that you can define 
these different summations in different ways. There's some flexibility there. And there are some other properties that we look at with summation that you'll see in practice um, in, in some of your work. But there are two properties that we want to look at here beyond just playing with the indexes that will be helpful to you. Again, the, the point of these properties is to give you some flexibility. That's as properties of summation, not my neatest work. So the first one, imagine you're trying to add. You're trying to find the uh, sum of a, of a sequence going from 1 to n. And the sequence has several terms in it, plus or minus b, k. You could plug in k to both, add the sequences, and repeat it over and over again. Or you can split this apart into its separate terms, find the sums of those terms, and put them back together. So this might seem like, OK, maybe that doesn't make sense. Why can you do that? Well, you can split up the terms individually of the sequence and plug in these k values to see what's going on. And then you're good to go. And by good to go, I mean you're going to get the same thing. We have proofs of this that we will review. And then if you have a summation and you need to, it's helpful for some reason to get rid of this coefficient right here of a particular term, you can factor that out. So you can find the partial sum from 1 through n of, of, a, of a k, whatever that is, then multiply it by c. It'll be the same thing as multiplying each of the terms in the sequence by c as you add them. And that's just a distributive property, but we, we have proofs of that as well that we will review. That's a really brief introduction into summation. And like I said, we want to apply this to our arithmetic sequences. And now you've seen this before, maybe, that if you have a sequence where you're adding a constant amount, you're adding or subtracting a constant amount between the terms, that's an arithmetic sequence. And we don't say we don't call it m for slope, even though it's very similar to a linear equation. We call it d for common difference. Some people use different letters. But the idea is that unlike a linear equation where it's defined for any real number input, these are only defined for natural number inputs, just like all sequences are. So for example, look at this sequence right here. 4, 7, 10, 13, 16. This is an arithmetic sequence, and we can write our formula for it to quickly analyze it. Let's do that. And you'll see we're going to tie this to the summation. So when we have an arithmetic sequence right here, we call this our first term, just like we did in all sequences, our second term, and so on and so forth. And we want to find the nth term. Now, you might know the formula for this already, but just bear with me. Make sure you understand the logic of it. We start off with the, the first term is 4, and the second term is 4 plus 1, 3, which is 7. Then the third term, what is that? Well, it starts at 4, and then it adds 3 and 3 again. 3 and 3. So it adds two 3s, and so on and so forth. So it's 4 plus 6 is 10. I'll do one more. The fourth term is 4 plus 1, 2, 3 3s. So it's 4 plus 9, or 13. So what's happening here? Well, we start off with our first term in the sequence, 4. And then we add our, our common difference of 3 this many times, 1 time, 2 times, 3 times. And if I wanted to show for the first term, it would be 0 times. In general, the amount of times we add the 3 is 1 less than the step number here. And that makes sense because we're starting at the step number, then we're hopping up by 3 each time from that point. So here, it's going to be time, n minus 1 times our common difference of 3. And this would be the explicit formula for this arithmetic sequence. And in general, we say that an arithmetic sequence starts at a. You can call it a1, but we just write a that implies the starting, t starting term, plus n minus 1 times the common difference d. right? So this is the first term, this is the common difference. And there are many interesting problems to explore with this. You've seen a bunch of these before. We're going to explore one particular sequence um, and the idea of what happens when we look at a series that involves an arithmetic sequence. Like what can we conclude? So again, the sequence, every term has a constant difference, d. Here is one. right? This is an arithmetic sequence being added. So it's a series of an arithmetic sequence. What is? What is, what are we doing here? Take a moment and think about this. This is telling us 
to add up all the terms of a sequence. Start at 1, go to the nth term, and we start by plugging in 1 into k, and then 2 into k. But k is, this, that, this rule here is just the variable you're plugging in. So when you plug in 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, you just get 1, 2, 3, 4, and you want to add them. We want to add them all up, all the way up to the nth term. So we start off at 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n. So it's a very simple arithmetic sequence that we're adding. So it's a series of a, probably the simplest arithmetic sequence there is, counting by 1. But this is still interesting. This goes back to a famous problem you might be familiar with, where we want to add up the first 100 counting numbers. Supposedly, it was a punishment for a student uh, who, be, who is now who, a student named Gauss, who is a very famous mathematician. And the teacher might have been thinking, OK, this will be their punishment. They'll add the numbers 1 through 100. They'll keep them busy, starting at 1, plus 2 is 3, plus 3 is 6, plus 4, and so on and so forth. But Gauss found that this is, can be quickly solved, and this is 5,050. And we should talk about a little bit about the thinking behind this problem and how we can apply it to any arithmetic sequence, not just the counting numbers. So we're taking it beyond the counting numbers, and that's where we finish this video. Okay, so imagine that we're adding 1 through 100. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus all the way up to 100. 98 plus 99 plus 100. Instead of going left to right, imagine if we doubled the sequence and then wrote it backwards. 99 plus 98, and thought about it maybe this way. And there are other ways to think about it, but I'm, just, I'm going to show you this one because it's particularly helpful into what we're about to prove. Well, if we did this, let's just agree, if we added this sequence to this one, whatever we get is too big. It's twice as big as the number we want, right? We're adding 1 through 100 twice. And at first glance, this might seem like really difficult. But then if we look down here, if we just kind of think about the way we add up and down, we have 1 plus 100, 2 plus 99, 3 plus 98, 98 plus 3. Think about what you notice there. As you add each of these pairs, what do you notice? Well, every single time we do this, we get 101. So that might help us, right? Because, OK, it's just the same sum over and over again. How many times are we adding 101? Right? How many how many pairs do we have here? This is a pair, this is a pair, this is a pair. Well, there are a hundred numbers here, aren't there? One through a hundred. Yeah, there are a hundred numbers, and they're each a hundred and one. But that's too big. It's twice as big as it needs to be, so we divide it by two. And that's just the same thing as 50 times 101, which is 5,050, which is our sum right here. So what does that mean? Well, if we're adding up, right here's our summation notation, between 1 and n of k, this has to equal, let's just analyze what we have here. We have 100 times 101 over 2. So 1, 100 is equal to the number of terms. It's just k. 101 is just k plus 1 over, in our case right here, 2. So this is true for this arithmetic sequence over here. If you want to add 1 through n, you could take, um, for, for the function k, you take k times k plus 1 over 2. And this, this works whether k is even or odd. And there are also nice visual proofs of this. For example, let's say you're adding 1 through 4. 1 plus 2, I'll draw some dots, plus 3 plus 4. This is... Also a nice set of triangular numbers, but this is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 as a picture. Well, the idea is, again, if you double that sum and write it backwards, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, you end up seeing that, oh, this is just 4 times 5. And in general, let's say, for writing 1 through 4, this is k. This is 1 more than k, k plus 1. And visually, it's the area that we're finding. And in our case right here, it's k times k plus 1. But that's too big. It's too big. It's twice as big. So you cut it in two. And that just means that's supporting what we're saying over here. Because in our case, this is a much smaller problem. We're starting at k equals 1, and we're going up to 4. right? So that means we're doing 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4. But this formula is we do k times k plus 1 divided by 2. You can see that picture. It's 4 times 5, k times k plus 1. 
but that's 20 dots, that's the whole area of this model, but it's the original sum doubled, so we divide it back by 2. In other words, it's 20 over 2, or 10. So this formula checks out, and here's a picture of it. But um, we can go further, right? Gauss surely did. Instead of just looking at a simple arithmetic counting sequence, how would this apply if k was some kind of expression, arithmetic um, expression, uh, explicit, <laughs> explicit formula? So how do we take this beyond? What if we're not? What if I'm just looking at k? What if we're saying that we're looking at some explicit function for a arithmetic sequence where we start at some value a, and we add we add some value common difference d, and we do that k minus one times. So we're looking at this right now, going to sum between any starting value. We'll start at one to keep it simple, up to n of an arithmetic sequence. Right, what what do we do? Right? How does that work? In other words, they're not counting it by ones, it could be adding any amount between them. Well, Gauss knew what to do because here we're saying that um, our partial sum that we're looking at is um, A plus K minus one of times D. Let me actually fix that. That's a little sloppy. Um, we're looking at the partial sum, let me say it this way, from k equals 1 up to n of a plus k minus 1 times d. So this is, this is our arithmetic sequence formula right here. All right, so even though that might not be obvious what this is, let's start thinking about the terms. The first term we plug this in is just going to be a plus 1 minus 1 times d, and that's a plus 0 d a plus 0 d. The second term is going to be a plus 2 minus 1 times d or a plus 1 d. And then so on and so forth. Let's go to the last two terms because I don't have room to really fit three. And the last term, so we're going to end on the nth term, so it goes up to n. If I plug in n I get a plus n minus 1 times d. And then right before the nth term, right, this is my first term, actually let me down top, this is my first term, this is my second term, this is the nth term, and just one before that is the n minus 1 term, 1 before n minus 1. If you plug in that, we get a plus n minus 1 minus 1. So that's a plus n minus 1 minus 1 is n minus 2 times d. This is what our partial sum is. But just like when we with 100, we did 1 through 100, then we did it in reverse order on the bottom, so we do it again, same partial sum backwards, a plus n minus 1 times d plus a plus n minus 2 times d. So I'm now writing the nth term over here, the n minus 1 term over here, going backwards all the way to a plus 1d plus a plus 0d. Now, we add these up, just like we add 1 through 100, one term at a time. But again, something really nice happens. We're not going to get 101 each time, but we are going to get the same exact expression. Take a minute, pause the video. What do you think you're going to get? All right, try to figure it out. Think about how many of them are, and also think about the fact that, well, we're adding this partial sum twice. Partial sum twice, so we are right getting a result that's two times as big. It's too big. All right, so what do we get? Well, let's look at the first one. We get a plus a, so that's two a zero plus n minus one d. So remember, when you're adding the same variable, just add the coefficient. So it's zero plus n minus one. That's just n minus one times d, and this is what you get each time. Over here, you get two a plus I can add the coefficients, 1 plus n minus 2 is n minus 1. All the way down, you get this over and over again. How many times will this happen? Well, there are n terms in the sequence, so this is going to happen n times. And this is the partial sum twice, so it's 2 times sn. But we don't want to know twice our partial sum, we want to know what our partial sum is, so we divide both sides by 2. So let's put the n in the front, makes it a little bit cleaner, times 2a 
plus n minus 1 times d over 2. Now this is true, right? You're basically done at this point, but we can rewrite this in a different way. This is n times a plus a is 2a. And check this out, it's really cool. a plus a plus n minus 1 times d over 2. Why would I write it that way? Because, look at this, I love this part, a plus n minus 1 times d. What is that? Well, that is the arithmetic sequence. So what this tells us is that we're finding the partial sum up to the nth term. So we take n, the number of terms, and multiply it by the starting value plus the value of the nth term and divide it by 2. And that connects to our starting problem that we I showed you with Gauss. Go from 1 through 100, and we're just looking at the counting numbers. Well, there are n terms here. That's this value, right, up to 100. There are 100 terms in the sequence. Multiply it by the starting term. That's just 1, the first counting number, plus the nth term. So plug in 100 into k, and we get plus 100. And that's over 2. That's exactly what we had. We had 100 times 101 over 2, which is 5,050. But this will work for any arithmetic sequence. And I encourage you to think about how to extend this. Right now we're still starting at k equals 1, but think about how this might change if we start at different k values. And if you couldn't get it to, um, if you if you're not sure what to do, think about how to change the starting and ending values to get to come back to one, right? We have that flexibility. All right, I hope this helped.